That's good. Yeah, cool. Um, quick intro. Uh, Ian Mardoch, I'm based out of Germany at the moment. I've been doing electrification and e-mobility for about 16 years. I was CTO at Ionity before I joined ThoughtWorks. Ionity is like Iona or Electrify America, just better. And, um, we, uh, before that, at ABB, so I've been around um, electricity for a long time. Love the topic and have enjoyed my time introducing uh, ThoughtWorks' engineering capability in this uh, space. So hi, yeah, uh, I'm Dale. I'm a lead engineer with ThoughtWorks. Uh, I've been a software engineer for mm, 28 years or something like that. Um, and I've been with ThoughtWorks for nine years. And I generally help our clients solve difficult problems. Uh, and in terms of Maeve, I was the uh, lead engineer on the project. Thank you. So we're going to give you a quick rundown on what Meve is and um, how we built it. So you get some more insights. Justin's done a wonderful job of explaining um, what we all need to know about a CSMS. So we're not going to go into covering the same stuff again. I'm really glad you did that first. So we can talk a bit about how we did it and how you might engage with it. But everything Justin said applies as well here. Meve, to a large extent, does the same thing. It is more advanced in some areas and less advanced in others, as the teams had slightly different priorities on what they worked on. Um, for those who don't know ThoughtWorks, just one short overview. Uh, originally out of Chicago, now in about 19 countries around the world, uh, 10,000 people, roughly, NASDAQ listed these days, and um, in the industry, reasonably well known for software engineering practices. So you'll not know ThoughtWorks for a specific product, you'll know it for having been there for the definition of things around microservices or DevOps or testing frameworks like Selenium and those kinds of things. And you'll see that is still very much present in how ThoughtWorks works, and Dale is going to go into that in a bit. I'll cover of the product side, because that was my role <clears throat> on the project, uh, to steer and guide uh, what we're developing and why we're developing it, and Dale um, pulled together the team to actually make it happen. We see e-mobility and electric vehicles in a number of different industries, obviously automotive sector, obviously utilities, but also lots of retail and uh, lots of fleet operators are our current customers of ThoughtWorks for other back-end systems. Um, and so it was quite natural for ThoughtWorks to also start to support the journey towards um, their electrification needs. And the offering from ThoughtWorks is along the lines of CSMSs, MSP products, and mobility service products, um, particularly used in Europe, mobile applications, and everything is API based at this point. Um, everybody's already got systems. Everyone we talk to wants to keep running their own business logic, so we just bolt onto that. For that, we've developed a number of different assets that now have turned into open source projects as well, with Meve as the CSMS, Neve, the sister project for the MSP product talk about that in a second, and um, something called AIville, which is effectively site scouting, site profitability, site analysis for a charging site. And it's all underpinned by various partnerships that ThoughtWorks has with all the cloud providers for EV stuff. We, we're currently on GCP. We're using Stripe for payments, and um, just like S44, we're also a member of the OTA and the EV Roaming Foundation. I'm involved in standardization conversations for OCPI and OCPP. Why is it not talking there? Right. That's me um, every time I start a new e-mobility project. Um, I've been at Ionity where we built our own backend. I've supported other CPOs in building their own backends. I've worked with standard software. I cried a lot over it. Um, I've built home charging, full service providers. I've built MSPs. Been in, in that space over and over and over. 
and it's so frustrating that you, feel, you see the same problems and you try to remember, how did I solve this last time? Or the spec change, or I've got an errata document, or whatever, and you're trawling through lots of PDF documents and there's just not an efficient way to handle what you've got here. Particularly if you're, you're like me and you don't keep up with every change and you don't have everything perfectly curated on your laptop, so when you start a new project you'd have it ready to your hand. You think I have, but I don't. Um, so a lot of development time goes into solving the same problem over and over and over. And we're not actually creating a lot of business value with just having a protocol broker running. We should really focus on how does this CPO want to be different? How does this charger manufacturer different? What should they be doing so that they can stand out in the crowd? And we shouldn't be worrying about OCPP 1.6, 2.01, 2.1 soon. There has to be extensions or something else that somebody might have been running. Um, and then we go to plug fest and testables, and we have interoperability tests, which are cool. They're fun. I love them. But really, they're also a sign of immaturity of our industry. We should be able to solve this differently. We know how to develop good software. We have testing practices test automation. We do this all day long. We have to be able to do it differently. And I, for one, want to spend more time on innovative things and not on implementing OCPP again and again. So we said, let's build me and build one. The, the, the faint, there's probably a, another cartoon somewhere about, yeah, let's create one more standard or one, one more to rule them all or something like it. Um, so we went out and Dale's going to detail how that exactly worked and how we got there, but effectively what we ended up with is a CSMS that is focused on the non-differentiating parts of, of the work. We've open sourced it. It does things like multiple OCPP protocols, OCPI uh, connectors, plug and charge, multiple root CAs, modern tech stack, infrastructure as code, deployed on whatever cloud you want. Um, those kinds of things that everybody will need anyway. They're in the OCPP part. There's a private code base for our other customers, uh, for, the, for our customers, paying customers, a bit like what Alex showed on the wheel of how open source works. Everest has Basecamp, so the ThoughtWorks have a um, private code repository where we serve fleet customers, utility customers, OEMs, CPOs who already have other capabilities and are using this to augment uh, some of what they're doing. So what is me? What's in the tin? Um, right now, it's a OCPP 201 implementation. It also has the 1.6 uh, broker in, uh, protocol in there. And it has very similar architecture to um, <laughs> what S44 showed a bit earlier as well. We're running plug-in charge uh, on there for both OCPP 201 and 1 1.6 for those chargers who support it. Um, charge session management uh, is in there. We're simulating chargers thanks to many other open source libraries um, that are out there that we can lean on. And we've done extensive work on logging and monitoring, and you see how and why in a moment. But um, my point earlier was we wanted to focus on the software engineering practices that are really cool at ThoughtWorks and that are different from how I've at least developed in my previous life. Um, and so we have um, extensive tooling for other developers in the, baked into that as well. Neve, which is just, an, if you look up baby names, it's just the next one on the list. That's how we came up with Neve, right? It's the sister project. Uh, effectively, it's an OCPI 2.2 broker and backend. Same story, just different protocol, right? So um, it handles the charging sessions. Um, so charge data records would be generated and passed between a charge point operator and whoever holds the um, mobility service contract for those who have those roles split. And it's, we've built some end user applications that do some routing and billing uh, and those kinds of things as well. And obviously subscription handling. So effectively out of the box, you can get yourself set up with a MSP product. 
And um, we're also looking forward to OCPI 3.0 once it's finally released. We're very much following, because of our fleet work, we're following the work on trucks as well, quite a lot uh, involved in that. Um, we can add, I was telling somebody earlier, there's you know, use cases in V2G for snowmobiles in Scandinavia. Um, there's work on ships as well, where we're involved. So a lot of these, anything that's electrifying will need some session management, needs some authorizations. Needs, it's always the same thing, effectively, if you look at the, the capabilities provided. So and those would all be customers of ThoughtWorks already. That so was quite natural that we would come and bring the electrification capability to that as well. Neve is not open source just yet. That conversation is ongoing. A bit about that later on. Um, I'll start off with this and then you yeah. take over. Cool. Uh, very simplistic architecture on a slide. Um, Neve in the pink box does the OCPP handling. It can talk to Hubject as a roaming hub. Who here is familiar with Hubject? Many Europeans. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the thing, right? So, uh, in Europe, we've got charge point operators and mobility service providers who issue a contract uh, to customers as a payment authorization. And they can, um, yeah, Martin's nodding, I'm getting this right. <laughs> um, not so common in North America. Hubject is present here as well. It would be cool because then you wouldn't need five apps anymore. I use one most of the time for all networks in Europe. Um, which are obviously much more fragmented than here, but um, you then need a form of communication between the subscription issuer and the charge point operator, same thing as in mobile phones, and um, that goes via clearing houses or roaming hubs. And Hubject is one of three that I'm aware of, and um, the one that has a root CA for plug and charge, which is why we worked with them as well. In the meantime, we've also got, um, well, we've tested the, uh, different routes EA as well, so we're confident that um, Neve can handle multiple routes. And um, at the bottom, you see Neve, effectively subscription handling, payment handling, those kinds of things, and end user um, communication. In between them, the OCI pro OCPI protocol. And with OCPI, it's not um, explicit on here. It's where you get all your point of interest information as well. Where, where are the chargers? What kind of plugs are on there? What kind of payments are accepted? That kind of communication would be transported on that protocol there. Cool. Dale, do you want to start? OK. Uh, oh, I need to come up here, Tom. Um, yeah, so I'm probably going to like dash over a couple of these slides because uh, there's some, probably some more interesting things to come. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the history uh, of MAVE and how it came about. Uh, so I'm going yeah, to use this one. Um, so MAVE started life as a proof of concept uh, for plug and charge. Uh, we had a client, uh, they've been struggling to build their own plug and charge implementation for some time. Um, and we thought we can show you that it's really not that hard. Um, and so we took uh, a team of developers. We had four developers uh, along with two tech leads, uh, which I was one of those. They had pretty limited experience of OCPP at the time. Um, and we had three weeks to build out a demo that showed plug and charge in action. Um, so at the point we started, we didn't have a CSMS. Um, and having looked around, at the time we couldn't find uh, a charge station simulator that would do OCPP 201 with plug and charge. So um, we decided that in order to show this, we'd need to build out a simulator and we'd also then need to build out the CSMS uh, with support for plug and charge. And the way we took that uh, was we had three one-week iterations, and each of those iterations had a specific goal. And so in the first, first week, we uh, decided to try and just get the two systems up, have some basic protocol messages going, uh, boot notifications, heartbeats, that kind of thing, uh, so make sure they could communicate. Week two, we moved on and actually built the basic uh, plug and charge authorization 
So uh, the, uh, the simulator would send the certificate chain uh, and the CSMS would uh, validate that certificate chain, pull out the made, check that the token matched uh, one that was configured for it. And then we got a third week to actually like polish it, to do some of the other bits, um, handle situations where we get, instead of getting the certificate chain, you get the certificate hashes, um, oh, do the OCSP checks, uh, and um, a th few things like that. So a few enhancements to the, the thing. Now that seems like a pretty ambitious schedule, um, and uh, we managed it. And the, the, the approaches that we took to this, uh, we used a number of engineering practices that we call our sensible defaults. Um, and so the first of those was pair programming. So each of our developers, they worked as they worked as a pair. So we had two developer pairs working, uh, and each pair would work on a specific task together. Um, and this is really useful because um, it, really, it, allows, it really allows you to, to get focus. So focus is a real strength of this. Um, it allows time to have two different modes of thinking going on. So you can have someone who's really thinking about what do I need to write as the next line uh, of code, and you can have someone who's just got that slightly taken aback view where they can go, ah, how's this fitting into the bigger fit picture? Do we need to make some changes elsewhere to keep the code clean? and keep our quality high. Uh, along with that, we did uh, test-driven development. So for each uh, piece of functionality that we were implementing, we wrote some tests, and uh, we iterated on the code until all of our tests passed. As I mentioned, we were constantly refactoring, um, and we were performing frequent and continuous integration. So multiple times each day, the dev pair would commit this code to the shared repository, would run a bunch of tests between uh, the simulator and the CSMS, and we'd see how we were progressing and make sure that as we added the new features, uh, everything uh, married up on both sides. Okay, so that's something. Uh, aha, right. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the architecture of, of MAVE. So, um, and because at the end of this process, we were like, okay, we've done this, we've shown that we can do plug and charge. Uh, now we've got this like bare bones CSMS. Now, is, is there any other interesting problems that we could go out there and look to solve? And one of those that we'd seen uh, kind of struggling with again was how to scale their CSMS. Um, now, OCPP is a stateful protocol. Uh, you know, there's a persistent connection between each charging station and the CSMS. Um, each message exchange involves a request and a response pair, um, and the response doesn't actually contain enough information to know what to do with it unless you know which request it was to go with. Um, and it's also a bi-directional process, bi-directional uh, protocol. You know, messages can, uh, exchanges can originate with the charge station, or they can originate with the CSMS. So our approach to this was to split the CSMS into multiple components. Um, so the uh, OCPP gateway is the stateful component. It holds the connection to the charge station, the WebSocket, um, and it also just remembers the last couple of messages that were sent by the CSMS when it originated the exchange. Um, and that allows it to couple that back up with the original, uh, so when we get the response back from the charge station, it can couple that up with the original request, and so we'll know actually what to do with the message that comes back from the charge station. Um, now, you might wonder why it keeps a couple of messages when each message is a request response exchange. Um, well, because a WebSocket is a full duplex connection, it's actually possible for messages to cross um, and so the, having both a couple of messages uh, allows us to handle that edge case. So the gateway is connected to a stateless backend component, the manager, um, and it does that over an MQTT broker. So the manager components uh, have all the business logic in them. They've got the APIs of both the, our internal API and the OCPI implementation on them, uh, and they subscribe to 
um, messages on the MQTT broker using a shared subscription. So when we get an incoming message, it comes to the broker and any one of the uh, manager instances will be able to pick up that message and process it. So it's kind of acting as a load balancer there. However, for messages that need to go the other way, so when, the message, when we get a response or a message that's being initiated by the CSMS, we need to make sure that goes to the correct gateway instance so that the one that's actually got the WebSocket open to the client, because otherwise it's not going to um, make it all the way back to the charge station. And so for that case, um, we have a per, per charge station uh, topic, uh, and we post to the relevant charge station, and only the uh, OCPP gateway that actually has that connection open will subscribe to that. Now, an advantage of this approach is that you know, almost all the business logic is living in the manager component. And um, this means that we can actually replace the manager component with absolutely no impact on, uh, on the connections with the actual charge stations. So our charge stations don't see, see any difference there at all. Giving Dale a, a break to breathe here. Um, <laughs> at last test of all, it, we had an issue, we had a bug somewhere in, in our manager. Um, Dale fixed the bug, redeployed, and we didn't have to reconnect the charging session. The, the um, colleague from the charger manufacturer didn't realize that we had fixed the bug while we were testing. So it's one of the, the nice things that you can, um, you can then start to do. Um, in my time uh, at CPOs, uh, that was always a pain point. We have to, had to wait for charging sessions to stop uh, before we could deploy and to make sure that we have the appropriate timing. We had to completely reboot the charger and everything to get all the connections back up and running. That's over. We've got smarter ways of dealing with it. Um, the gateway components, obviously, they are holding the connection and when they need to be replaced, we will lose uh, those connections and they'll need to be reconnected. However, the gateway component's really thin doesn't do very much, it doesn't need to get changed very often. Really, it's only when there's a security update on one of its dependencies. Um, and also because we've horizontally scaled this, we can perform a rolling upgrade on it. So um, we don't end up with all of our charge stations trying to reconnect at the same time. We, uh, it also allows us to canary changes. So when we canary them, we use our telemetry to guide the rollout. So between uh, between replacing each instance of either the gateway or the manager, we can have a short pause and we can let the telemetry uh, tell us if um, there's a problem that's going to, and we can pause the rollout or continue it depending on, on that. Okay. And do I have a slide to go with this? No. Yes. No. Oh, yeah. I'll be right back to that one. Um, so another challenge, of course, is that uh, connections to charge stations are frequently unstable. Um, and MAVE is designed to expect uh, message loss um, and reconnections. And to do this, it builds on top of the OCPP protocol, tries to follow the same patterns. No, so in OCPP, charge stations required to buffer and retry uh, important messages. So I know the related to transactions. And we, oh, it was the next slide. Um, and in me, we use a, a similar approach for, uh, for messages that begin uh, at the CSMS. So uh, essentially, we run a reconciliation loop. So uh, the CSMS, when it's trying to apply a configuration change, um, it's going to retry uh, on a regular basis until we receive the update from uh, the charge station to say, yes, I have, I have done that. At the moment, the approach is slightly simpler than what's in the diagram, um, but this is what we're looking to do as we implement the device model. 
Um, we intend to try and implement this full observe, diff and act approach. So we observe the current state of the charge station configuration so we know exactly what situation it is. Uh, we can say, well, this is what the desired state is. And then we can go, what's the difference and what changes do I need to make to bring my, uh, my full fleet of charge stations uh, into sync with the desired configuration. Um, and of course, as you do that, you might have different types of charge stations that want to have different configurations and all of that. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that we're looking to develop next. Now, don't worry about this diagram because uh, we're not going to go into any details. Um, something that we discovered, um, and this wasn't a problem that we were intending to try and solve, uh, but when, you when we deployed MAVE into the cloud uh, and we were doing security pro uh, profile three, so mutual TLS, um, we found there were some, some additional challenges. Because when, uh, when you were deploying this into the cloud, the load balancer uh, is the thing that receives all of the connections from the, uh, from the charge stations. And it needs to terminate the TLS connection, validate that the certificate that's been presented to the client certificate is, is good using the CA that you use to issue that. Um, and it turns out that having done all of that, it might not give you the full certificate back. And yet OC, OCPP requires that we do some additional checks. It requires that we check that the common name contains the charging station serial number and that the organization element actually matches one that's trusted. So um, as well as building out like all of these things here, this is, this is a picture of Meade's Google deployment for, for the load balancer. There's these other, these other issues to do. So um, Meave actually stores the, the certificates in its database so that if it just receives a hash, which is what happens in Google Cloud, um, it can actually pull the certificate that matches that hash out of the database and we can do all those extra checks. Um, not quite so difficult on AWS. Uh, AWS, you get an option to actually get the full certificate chain. Better than Google Cloud for that one. Um, the, um, another thing that we discovered, though, is that cloud, these, uh, when doing the validation, uh, the cloud load balancers, they, can't, they might have slightly different requirements for the CA certificates that were used to issue the client certificate. Um, and, and in particular, they might want to have uh, some specific values in the extended key usage field. And we were using Hubjects to issue CSO certificates so they could be used for both the ISO 15118 inter uh, interface on the charging station and as the client certificate for the CSMS. Doesn't work. Um, there, you can't do that. So uh, to, instead, what we've done is we've given an option inside MAVE to, for it to act as its own CA for the client certificates while still issuing the ISO 15118 uh, certificate, CSO certificate, uh, using the PKI providers like Hubject, so that because those have to derive from the V2G root certificate. I am possibly taking much too much time. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the tech stack that we use for building MAVE. So the uh, the, the original charge station simulator that we built um, used the uh, Mobility House Python OCPP libraries. Um, we don't maintain that tool anymore because we now use Everest to be our principal test client. The Mead CMS itself is written in Golang. Um, the principal reason for that was it was the language which the client that we were doing the demo for uh, was, was using. However, it does have a number of characteristics that make it quite suitable, um, particularly around concurrency, goes concurrency routines with go routines and channels, uh, makes handling a large number of simultaneous connections uh, really easy. Um, its compilation speed is fast, which makes getting fast feedback uh, better. The go toolchain is really nice um, and it does 
almost all the things that you want out of the box. So there's not lots of decisions to make about uh, how you set, how I use it, sets it up as a developer. You know, basically all Go projects work the same for everyone. So a developer can sit down and if they know Go at all, they'll know how to how to interact with your project. Um, and essentially it's fun uh, and it just works. So yeah, we're big fans of Go and that's worked really well for us. Um, the broker, we're using MQTT. MQTT is nice, it's low latency. There's zero cost to creating new topics, which so we have one per charge station. You might have thousands and thousands of charge stations connected to Maeve. Um, that's really uh, helps. Uh, we also run it with the quality of service of zero, which is no guaranteed delivery because we're expecting packet, well, we're expecting message loss anyway. And we've got compensatory controls to handle message loss. So there's no need to take the extra costs um, at that layer. Uh, for our test environment, we use Mosquito. Uh, but you could run it with Hive MQ, AWS IoT, or any other MQTT5 broker. Um, so this will address the, the question that came earlier, or S44, around uh, cloud dependency. At the moment, the database that we use in Mave is Google's Firestore. So, um, yep, it's a nice low latency document database, but uh, all of our database access is pluggable, um, so it's all all the actual access is via high-level APIs that say what we want to achieve, not how to achieve them, um, and so there's no reason that we couldn't fairly easily plug in Dynamo or a SQL database if you want, um, or it could just connect straight into your back-end system through an API and start extracting data from there, uh, because again, Lots of times we find people already have a lot of this stuff already built uh, and we just need to be able to interface with it. Uh, and that's made easy because we don't have any complex relationships between uh, the different um, documents that we store in the database. And we've also used that same kind of pluggable approach to most of the other parts of the CSMS. Um, so if you want to use a different PKI provider uh, rather than Hubject, you can just implement the relevant PKI interface uh, to interface with them instead of uh, and, and plug that in and it just works. And we've done that for various clients. Uh, the broker implementation at the moment is MQTT. That one isn't pluggable, but I'm about three quarters of the way through the change to make that pluggable. So that'll, that'll be coming soon. Um, and the last bit I'm going to talk about for our tech stack is that the whole system is instrumented using open telemetry. Now, open telemetry is a, trace, a standardized tracing API. Um, and what this allows us is to understand and to analyze all the message exchanges that happen uh, uh, within the system. Um, we use, and our SaaS developer, we use uh, the Honeycomb uh, SaaS uh, provider ourselves. But that doesn't mean that you have to because open telemetry is a standard and lots and lots of providers um, support it, whether that's Lightstep, Datadog, New Relic, uh, or if you want an open source one like Jaeger, uh, you can plug those in with no code changes and you'll start to get uh, the similar capabilities. So that's like a whirlwind tour and I appreciate I've been running at 100 miles an hour. Um, uh, I'm gonna hand over to Ian to talk do some other stuff. Cool. Um, I'll try to catch up some stuff. You can, we're, we're obviously here today and tomorrow, so if there's any more questions, we can cover those separately. Um, MEV was intended for use by developers. So um, you can't pull it off the shelf and get all the functionality to, to, you need to run your CPO business. It's not the intent. Um, all that, that beautiful architecture and sort of laying it all out in the open is so that you can come and do your own thing with it. And that's um, for, before somebody asks about, have you got any CPOs using it? Yes, a number of them are using it, but they're not, it, because it's not plug and play, what, they, what people are doing is they're looking at the code base, and they're going, I'm stuck, this is a separate customer from the one we originally built this for. Um, they're like, we were stuck with plug and charge for six months, and we studied your code, and after two hours, we went click. 
pretty much copy paste into their code base and off they went. They were up and running, um, which is really good use for what we had intended as well. So how are people using it? Uh, there, some implementations just needed the plug and charge component. So that's what they went and, and sort of lifted out. Others are saying, well, I've got 1.6 running, I need a 201. Um, so they, they extract those parts where possible. Um, others are learning how to do open telemetry and observability better for their own system. They're just, it's a good learning opportunity if you've got um, well-written code, nice, nice clean architecture, well-documented um, architecture decision records are in the repository. You can see why things are as they are. Um, and so people are using it that way. And I mentioned this a number of times, um, fleet, fleet um, lots of trucks and LCVs uh, moving to electrification as well, or even just corporate fleets are using it to augment their current systems, which are totally sort of built around fuel cards and sort of loyalty points and those kinds of things. And they're now just plugging um, a charging capability off the back of that. Um, you can plug in cash registers. Uh, I've heard um, one, they're not a customer, but they did this on their own. They plugged in their charging stations into the cash register so that you have to go into the shop and go pay there and hopefully buy some snacks and things as well while you're doing that. Um, and load testing simulations, um, just like Justin said, open source tools are always, uh, uh, always good for testing purposes and um, the telemetry makes it easy to figure out where you're going wrong. One of our QAs um, had, uh, had, had run some load tests on their laptop and it was just a sort of MacBook, nothing special. And they were running 700 concurrent charging sessions before they started running out of memory on their laptop. So pretty performant, um, pretty cool, easy to use. Um, we have one charger manufacturer who's also used it as their reference implementation internally. Um, so they're developing their charger OTPP stack together with us and they're testing against me with it. Um, other use cases, just use it for inspiration. Have a look, it's just useful stuff, maybe it works in your projects. Um, plug it into an ERP. I've spent 10 years of my life implementing ERP systems for people. Um, I figured it would be cool to just have the broker and plug it straight into the ERP without any of the, of the rest. I've already got business logic, more than I need. I've got billing, I've got contract management, I've got customer management, it's all there. All I need is to communicate with the charger. So use this and stick it in between, that could work. Um, or like me, uh, this was my first Go project, so I, I keep badgering um, Dale. I'm a horrible developer by comparison, so, so I learn. Um, and of course, you can, there's always something nice to talk about, uh, just in case we're by the fourth beer, we don't have anything else to talk about anymore. Um, and then we're here, obviously, uh, it's an, we're currently running on an Apache 2 license. Um, we're moving towards um, Linux Foundation Energy as well. Hopefully, in the coming two days, uh, we'll advance those conversations. Um, I personally, so having some product managed our way through this, I'm looking for uh, a better governance process. I think we can do better on that front. So I think that's something that Linux uh, Foundation does really well. Um, ThoughtWorks is a Linux Foundation member, just not on the energy part. And so we've seen how those can run. And um, we have a reference implementation. We're in conversations of um, having one specifically built as well and um, plugging some of the gaps so that others can come and see sort of the full stack of what is available from 1.6 to 2.1, the OCPI components, plug-in charge to the device model, um, the um, smart charging, and the flexibility integrations. So a lot of our utility work, of course, is focused on flexibility. B2G is a big topic. Uh, we've been testing B2G chargers and um, providing feedback on that front as well. Um, it's not plug and play at this point, um, but we're working on those topics with customers. So I guess eventually it will come through here as well. And I think that's us. Thank you for your patience with us. Desperately over time. So. <laughs> Happy to take any questions now or at any, are we okay for time? Okay, cool. Fire away. The name you give it is 
Yes. Uh, no, we're not. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's the end. Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, first of all, my name is Dale. Great job on getting to all this together. Um, I'm really interested to hear about the, uh, the fast start for somebody trying to execute on plug-in cars. Um, was there any reluctance? Are you finding reluctance still on the object cars, or is that the same as it's been? Like, you have a lot of players in the game that oh, you're not in your head. Well, how, there's, there's, in my head, there's, there's two questions in yeah. that. So there's, there's two questions. Do we have any problems with people adopting plug and charge? And I want to clarify I'm getting this right. Um, there's a technology side to it, and there is a philosophical side to it of should we be doing auto charge or plug and charge? Which one, which one of those two questions do you want to answer? Well, you can, you can touch on the, the, the tools, you know, but more on the technology. Okay, I'll do 30 seconds on auto charge. So auto charge, for those who don't know, effectively a system where we validate a MAC address associated to a contract and um, thereby authorize the charging session. It's common on the supercharger network and Fastnet uh, have quite famously done that as well uh, in BV, the, the biggest charging network in Germany does that too. Um, everybody, everybody I know is working on plug and charge though, because it is inherently insecure. And no, I don't think a lot of fraud has happened with it, but you still shouldn't go promoting bad practices. In our CS um, first semester courses, we probably all spoofed MAC addresses, so we all know how that works. Um, but on the technology side, I think, yeah, Hubject has had the monopoly for, to a lot, for a long time on the root CA, which some people have objected to. Now there's more players coming to the market. Uh, Jaren sponsored, Irdeto now is taking that over. Uh, there's efforts in the US ongoing as well. So there's obviously multiple routes to choose from, which is probably good for the industry. Um, so on, on the commercial side, I think we're sort of over the hump. So maybe you want to talk about some of the technology issues that we still face. Um. I think I, I, I was just going to say, really, I was going to say is that, yeah, with multiple different PKI suppliers, we have helped them. Uh, we have worked with them. We uh, tested on a bunch of tests. So we do know that Maeve at least can handle um, that stuff. It's not, it's not in the open source version because we did it for a client. Um, and, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's multiple routes is, probably the solution to some of the business problems uh, around object. Well, yes, multiple routes are certainly good. What you end up with as well is um, for uh, very large trucks or off-highway vehicles, they have to charge in a very short period of time. They're going to have two inlets. They're going to have two uh, certificates on the vehicle as well. I don't think anybody specified that in the original um, plug-in charge setup. So vehicles have one certificate. Um, how am I now going to have authorization over multiple, those kinds of things. There's some business use cases that are coming out as we're implementing and we're learning. Cool. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. More questions? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, oh, a good comment. A uh, good comment is that uh, when I saw the evolution of the uh, evolution, right, uh, I have a heartfelt text because I think I went through some of that and you guys open source this and you know I think it's really good. It's cool. Okay, right. Uh second thing is uh I find out who's uh name. Is the Irish name? That's right. Yeah. So uh great take on the name. Uh ask the question is how many production chargers do you estimate is on the network? Do you have any? No. no, because as I say, it's not it's not a plug and play tool. People lift some pieces of code out. Um, so two two of the networks that are using some of our code bases have multiple thousands of chargers uh, connected to it. But I don't think that says much because it's not it's not me, right? It's just some of the code that made its way in there. Cool. Any other questions? Just grab it later on. Thank you. Thank you.
And there will be a lunch in a little bit that will hopefully offer more opportunity for some of that great discussion. So thanks so much, Dale. And Ian, for that great introduction to Meve. You were so kind when I asked if it was made. You kind of